Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome on all of our campuses, wherever you are. Welcome to those of you who are watching this online. Uh, we always start by uh, including you because you matter. And uh, welcome to those of you who are in the room with me right here, right now. And hey, I want to talk about two weekends right now before we get going. I want to talk about next weekend and I want to talk about last weekend. Next weekend is going to be very, very special. Every summer, we as a church host this event called the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, this year, it's August 4th and 5th, and we're going to hold it on our Mesa campus, on our Gilbert campus, and on our Queen Creek campus. And, and it's an opportunity, and literally thousands of us um, go to this thing, and we learn how to lead better. And it's for everybody. And I want you to, I really want to con you to consider coming. But every May, what we do is we have a weekend we designate a summit weekend in which we give you a sense, a taste of what the summit is actually about. And what we do is we usually play back a tape of one of the, uh, uh, a recording of one of the presentations at the summit so you get a feel of what it's like. This year, we're gonna do something different. We're gonna, we were very, very blessed in that we're gonna have one of the speakers from last year, a guy named Albert Tate, who's gonna be our guest in person here next week. And uh, he was here uh, a while back and I asked him, I said, what are the chances we can get you to come do this? And he agreed to do it and we're totally stoked. Now, Albert, is a phenomenal communicator. He's the lead pastor of Community Church in Monrovia, California, and he is he is just a really, really... If you ever wanted to hear what really good preaching sounds like, and I know you're dying to hear it, you need to come next week, and you'll be glad you did. But um, the deal is, is next week is the absolute cheapest you can register, so we run this thing, uh, get as many people to sign up as we can. If you sign up next week, and uh, you're in... Uh, you're like motivated to learn. Uh, with your registration comes uh, the ticket to another event that follows Sunday night after the summit, which is a gathering that we do called Beyond the Summit, in which I get to meet with you guys and we get to debrief and, and I get to share my insights from the summit and you get to share your insights from the summit. We did that last year, went over great. We're going to do that again. So that's next week. Now, uh, for those of you who are on this campus, uh, and this is very specific to Gilbert. Uh, the intersection next weekend of <laughs> Jermaine and Lindsay is going to be closed. Yeah, did you see that coming in today? So you're going to have to figure out how to get here without going through that intersection. And, and I want to make sure that you're here. So uh, just get it on your mind. You can go around different ways. All right. That's next weekend. Now, let's talk about last weekend. Last weekend. Last weekend was 148th running of the Kentucky Derby. And uh, I don't know if you follow horse racing at all, but any kind of racing like that is always built on odds. Uh, odds are uh, people's best guess, uh, people who are in the know, who really believe they know how it's going to turn out. They, they, they anticipate the results. They, they think about like oh, what the possibilities are, and then they determine the odds. And the higher the odds, the less likely, the lower the odds, the more likely. And uh, in this race last weekend, if you followed any of this, if you saw any of this, uh, there was one horse in particular, there were actually two horses, but one uh, named Epicenter that most people would say was favored to win the race. And so he had the best odds, and, and so the race, uh, that's how that's going to go. Um, there was another horse so that entered the race. Now, this is what you got to understand. If you don't know this, it's fascinating. This horse got in with 30 seconds to go. He got in with 30 seconds to go on, on uh, the day before. He got in because another horse dropped out. He, he squeaked in as close as you could squeak in. Uh, but because he was the very last horse, he was in the, uh, the 20th gate. He was on the wide outside. Uh, this horse's name was Rich Strike. And... Uh, they gave him, at first, they gave him 99 to 1 odds. Before the race started, they dropped it down to 80 to 1 odds. Let me translate what that means. This horse doesn't stand a shot. It doesn't have a prayer. Don't bet on this horse is what that means. All the other horses had better odds. Now, if you know about the Kentucky Derby, it's a mile and a quarter long. It takes just over two minutes to run. And I'm actually going to show you the last fourth of this race. I'm going to show you the final curve as they're coming into the straight, the, the uh, home stretch, the straightaway. And uh, you're going to see a couple of arrows. You're going to see arrows on Epicenter, the favorite horse. And you're going to see an arrow on this horse named Rich Strike. And uh, I just want you to see what happened. So watch this. 
Zozos is next after three quarters in one minute, ten and four foot seconds. And now Epicenter comes splitting horses and is moving up quickly as Crown Pride takes the lead around the far turn. It is Crown Pride battling with Messier. They're stride for stride. Epicenter and Zozos in behind them. Cyberknife sweeps up on the outside. Sandon gets the rail run and they're into the stretch. It is Messier, Crown Pride, and Epicenter is coming up on the outside. Epicenter has taken the lead as they arrive into the final furlong. Sandon is coming after him. Epicenter and Sandon, these two, stride for stride. Simplification down the outside is next. They're coming down to the wire. Epicenter, Sandon, Rich strike is coming up on the inside. Oh my goodness, the longest shot has won the Kentucky Derby. You are why I love this church right there. I've watched that thing so many times. <laughs> yeah, way to go. Uh, yeah, what are, what are the odds, man? Uh, that, that horse, by the way, those horses typically cost around uh, like half a million dollars. That horse got bought last year for $30,000. And the big deal is when you win the Derby, you, uh, you get set up for breeding and you, uh, you know, your genes are like really in, you know, you're popular. So anyway, that, uh, that horse has it made. But the reason I showed you that is, is just to make a point that's going to lead us through the book of Galatians. Nobody predicted he could win. No, nobody, all the odds makers said, don't put your money on this. All the odds makers who were in the know said it won't happen. It won't happen. Uh, it's a long, 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 long shot. All right. Uh, and it was a totally unexpected outcome. Now, in the book of Galatians, we've been talking about the fact that uh, in Christ, we've been set free, that Christ literally came to set us free. And uh, in fact, let's do this. Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter five. We'll, we're going to pick up where we've left off in Galatians chapter five. And we've been talking about this freedom. Well, freedom from what? Fr freedom from living with a bunch of rules. Uh, freedom from living under the bondage of religion. Freedom from living with condemnation and judgment and, you know, uh, all of this legalism bearing down on us. Uh, it, it, is, it is the way uh, that people like to put other people in subjection. But Jesus Christ literally set us free from that. Now, instead of living under the law and the rules, we were given a gift that we've talked about called grace. Now, grace means that um, you, you don't earn it. It's a gift. Grace means you don't deserve it. It's a gift. Grace means that if there's any logical reason why it would be given to you, it wouldn't actually be grace. But, but what God did is in, instead of giving us a bunch of laws to live by, he, he gave us grace to live. And, and I, I would say it this way, and I've said it before, grace means you don't get what you do deserve. And you do get what you don't deserve. You, you don't get what you do deserve is you deserve and I deserve to go to hell for the sins I've committed. What I, I, I don't get hell, but I do get what I don't deserve, which is I get heaven because of what Jesus did, not because of what I did. All right. And that's and that's crazy. Now, if you tried to sum up the entire book of Galatians and you just try to capture it in a phrase, you might use this one. Listen carefully. We are free to live by grace. We are free to live by grace. You could also say we are free to no longer be sinners. We are free to no longer live under uh, the slavery of sin. Now, those are mind blowing ideas, but, but that's what we're going to talk about. Now, again, why, what does it have to do with the Kentucky Derby? See, most people would bet the odds that if God took the restraint off of us, we would go uncorked. That most people would believe that if God took away the punishment and the fear of punishment hanging over our head, that we, we literally would go into deep debauchery, that we would literally go off the deep end, hit the skids. And, and all the odds would say that's exactly what would happen. Except God said, I'm going to give you this thing called grace. And, and it's as if God knew what people didn't know. Now, there are all kinds of people who love to keep us in bondage to religion. And again, we've covered this. There's all kinds of people that want to 
you got to do this. And if you want to please God, you got to do that. And, and here's the list and here's the boxes and you got to check them all. Um, but, but somehow in all of this, the, uh, the truth of the matter is God, God goes, you know what? I, I'm going to, I'm going to take the restraint off and it's going to do exactly opposite what you anticipate it doing. Okay. So again, the odds are take away restraint. Sin's going to abound. God goes, no, it won't because of something he knows and what he knows is what we're going to discover today. Now, uh, what would happen uh, if God set us free? Uh, something you'd never, you'd never guess. You'd never guess. All right. So let's do this. Let's get into Galatians chapter five, verses 13 to 26 is our text. We'll do what we normally do is we'll take it in three little chunks. And so just uh, follow along. Always do bring a Bible. It makes it so much easier. So Galatians 5, 13 to 16. Uh, let's just dive in here. OK, so you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. The whole theme: you have been called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. So right out of the gate, the first thing Paul says is you've been set free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Why does he have to say that? Because when we hear we're free, many of our minds go to oh, I, that means I can get away with anything. I can do anything. I, I don't have this. I don't have this burden to, to, you know, to do the right thing anymore on me because it's taken away. It, it, it's not like it doesn't make sense. But like why? Why? You know, why would we think we would indulge the sinful nature? And the answer is because most of us would, our first choice would be to indulge the sinful nature. Now let, me, now, let me say something. Listen very carefully to this. You have and I have a sinful nature. Now, what, what does that mean? It, it means that I am inclined to sin. I don't have to try to sin. I don't have to think about sinning. I don't have to uh, plot sinning. I don't have to work myself up into a plan to sin. Sinning comes naturally to me. All right. And uh, it, it just is it's second. It's uh, well, I want to say second nature. It just comes. And 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 unless you think I'm making a confession, I again want to repeat it does the same thing to you. It's just in you. I don't know if you've ever met anyone who is um, naturally slim. Uh, they, I mean, it's like no matter what they eat, no matter what they do or don't do with working out, they're just slim. And if you've ever talked to somebody who's naturally slim and, you, you know, you might ask, how do you do it? Often the answer they'll give you is genetics. I'll just go, it's in my genes, man. I, I just, my, it, I, my metabolism, you know, I just, I can eat anything in my metabolism and I, I don't have to work at it. It just comes naturally. You know what's in my genes? To get fat. That's in my genes. I have to work at not getting fat. I can put weight on very, very easily. OK, but my biggest genetic problem is not I have a slow metabolism. My biggest genetic problem is I have a sinful nature that craves things that are harmful to my soul. All right. That that is the state. Uh, that's the natural uh, genetic state. Now, um, Paul said it this way. He, he said in Romans seven eighteen. He, and you might be familiar with this. He said, I, I know. And this is the guy that wrote this, by the way. He said, I know that nothing good lives in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now, now if, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Now, now, follow what's being said here. I have a natural tendency to want to live by rules. I have a natural tendency to have somebody tell me what I can and can't do as far as religion goes, as do you. So that's why people can take advantage of us, because they'll give you all the lists. All right. That's an external bondage. You subject yourself to that. And last or two weeks ago, we talked about don't submit yourself again to a yoke of slavery to that stuff. But that's an external. I have an internal tendency. Uh, I, I have an internal tendency to uh, default to sin. I, I, I have this thing inside me that I, I could very quickly become a slave to sin. 
If I became a slave to sin, sin would literally be my taskmaster. It would tell me everything I do. I, I could very easily tell you I could fall into that quickly, as could you. And so, again, what are the odds? Well, it depends. If I'm by myself, I don't stand a chance. But God knows something, and that's what I want you to see. So there's an external bondage I have to resist, and there's an internal bondage. Uh, look closely at the second part of verse 13. And see, Paul said this, Do not use, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Did you see that? What? What does serving the flesh have to do with serving one another in love? Well, it has everything to do with it. You, You see, the flesh is all about me. My sinful nature is all about me. It's about getting what I want, living how I want to live. The idea of serving others is all about you. It's about putting you ahead of me. And what he's saying is, is if you don't check this, you don't die to yourself, you just live for yourself, you're going to indulge your selfish nature. You're just going to do it. Everything you see, you want. Everything you want, you go for. Doesn't matter if it's good or bad. You want it, you're going to go for it. But, but when you start to think about other people and like what are the implications of this for others, it starts to change the formula, all right? Uh, the Apostle Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 2.16. Live as free men, but do not use your, fre- your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. So I've been given freedom, but not freedom to do what I want to do for me. I've been given freedom to do what you need me to do. And I know this is hard for us to get our brain around. Uh, in fact, if you look at Galatians 5.14, it says it really well. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. You can sum it all up. Do this one thing. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, here's the deal. You can't love your neighbor as you love yourself if all you're occupied with is yourself. You can't put the needs of your neighbor anywhere ahead of your own needs if all you care about are your own needs. So he's saying, look, there's two natures. There's going to be this nature that's all about you, or there's going to be this nature that you could use your life to make a difference to people. Use your life to make a difference to people. Now, let me say this, though. Inside me and inside you, I have a war going on all of the time. I have a battle going on. I have opposing forces that are fighting. I I have a desire to do good, and I have a desire to do bad. I have a desire to do the right thing, and I have a desire to do the wrong thing. Uh, If you look down at verses 16 to 18, uh, he he says it in this way. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out, the, or you're not gratified, the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So I have this nature, which is evil, that wants me to do wrong, and it is very much uh, inside of me. It's really bad. And I have the Spirit of God, which is inside me, which is really good and wants to do the right thing. And these two battle. Uh, 1 Peter 2.11 said it this way, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. What's the war? Are you going to live by legalism or are you going to live by grace? Are you going to live by the spirit or are you going to live by the flesh? Are you going to live for the good or are you going to live for evil? Are you going to live a life of selflessness or are you going to live a life of selfishness? These are battles, all right? Now, two questions I want to ask you. Two questions. And, and uh, you don't have to say it out loud, but I challenge you to ask yourself, uh, ask yourself the question. Answer it honestly in your heart. You've got two natures in you, as I have two natures. Which one right now, currently right now, is winning the battle? Which is, where would the evidence point? The evil nature or the spirits leading? The second question, which one's inev- in, uh, inevitably, ultimately, going to win. Now, a lot of us say, well, yeah, I'm losing the battle now, but in the end, you know, we get, in a, we get on a road that's going a certain direction, and that direction goes to a certain destination. If, 
Right now, the, the flesh is currently dominating my decision making. I'm on the road to destruction. And ultimately, that's, if I don't get off that road, that's where it's going to lead me. And, and so, you know, we've got we to wrestle with this. Now, uh, I want to just say this about the battle we have to fight. All good generals know that before you go into war, you got to know your enemy. You got to know what you're up against. You got to know, like, what, what is this thing you're dealing with? How, uh, how strong is the enemy? What are the armaments? How much ammunition? So, so just think about the Ukraine Russian conflict, all right? The war that's going on over there. And, and uh, just whatever you think about that, did Putin understand the opposition? Most people would say he mis, misjudged it. He, he didn't estimate accurately their ability to defend themselves. And, and so you get into a war and you don't realize what you're up against. And then it's hard to extricate yourself because everything you thought wasn't what it was. I want to show you what Paul does here. Paul, Paul goes, look, you got two natures. You got, two, you got a battle going on inside of you. Let me make sure you know who the enemy is. Let me make sure you know what you're dealing with. So he lists all the sins of the flesh. No, not like all like in, he lists a whole list of things. This is what the flesh looks like, all right? Look at verses 19 to 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, we could spend time on each and every one of those words, and I could show you, you know, that the, the, the first word, you know, sexual immorality is a Greek word, pornea, which is where we get pornography, which is, no, I don't think we need to do that. I think the list is pretty clear. I think we get it. That, that's, the, that's what I'm fighting against in me, all of that. All right. That's that's that sinful nature. And if you didn't catch it, by the way, all of those things are about pleasing you. It's all about what you want for you. That's what that's about. And, and by the way, James said this, where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. When it's about me, I am literally going to slide into a deep life of self-centeredness. So Oh, wow, what, so what am I going to do there? Now, wh what does the life of the Spirit look like? So if the flesh is in control, I'll be doing those things. If the Spirit's in control, look at verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, against such things, there isn't the law. You don't need to legislate against any of that. That's all good stuff. You don't have to tell anyone not to do that. So which nature is the one that describes the one that you're living, you're living out. And, and by the way, on that second list of the fruit of the spirit, last summer, we did an entire series called the credentialed life. We took each of those words and spent a week on it. You might want to go back and listen to it just so we understood it really well. But this is the fruit of the spirit. This is the spirit. If the spirit has its way in you, this is what will happen. If the self has its way in you, the first list is what's going to happen. So what did God know? He knew that he was going to give us his Holy Spirit and that was going to tilt the odds. It was the game changer. In fact, let me do this. Let me, let me show you four takeaways and, and, uh, uh, that, that this text, like four practical things. Here they are. Number one, it's having the Spirit of God within us that tilts the odds that we can live the life we were called to live. The odds makers didn't count on what the Spirit of God could do and how the Spirit of God can direct my life. It didn't count on the fact that when I, I, I walk with Jesus and I do things I shouldn't do, the Spirit of God puts his hand on my shoulder and presses against my, my heart. and makes me aware that I'm getting off the path. See, the odds are you take off all restraint. I'll just go crazy, but not with the Spirit living in me. The Spirit living in me changes it. And uh, it guides and it directs and and if you have Jesus, by the way, you have the Spirit of God in you. you. You can't have Jesus and not have the Spirit. You have the Spirit. The question is, are you utilizing the Spirit? So what do I do when the sinful nature starts like, asserting itself? Well, here's the answer is I got to turn to the Spirit of God and I have to plead for help, for strength. Uh, there's this old story that's told, you might have heard it about a hillbilly up in the Appalachian Mountains who 
had, he wanted to go get a new axe because his axe, had, you know, he sharpened it and it was dull and just felt like he needed a new one. So he went to a hardware store in town and he went up to the, the guy and he said, hey, I, I, need to, I need to get a new axe. And he, and he explained, and, and the guy said, why don't you get a chainsaw? You know, a chainsaw would make a big difference. He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, uh, a chainsaw, uh, what it will do is uh, an axe you can cut maybe a half a cord a, a day. Uh, but with a chainsaw, you can cut four or five cords. It makes everything easier. You should just buy a chainsaw. And the guy goes, seriously, four or five cords? He goes, yeah, it'll change your life. He goes, okay, I want one. So he buys it, goes back up into the hills, and the first day he gets out and goes to work and cuts a quarter of a quarter of wood. He's so discouraged. So the next day he got up earlier and stayed up a little bit later. He cut a half a quarter of wood. The third day he went to work, and he worked and worked and worked, and he, caught, he, he was able to cut three quarters of a quarter of wood. And by this time, he's so ticked off. He feels so taken by this uh, hardware uh, store uh, owner. He went back and, and he literally takes the saw back and he demands his money back. He says, you lied to me. You said, you promised me. And the guy said, what are you talking about? He goes, I tried I, a quarter of a quarter, half a quarter, three quarters of a quarter, nowhere near five quarts. You lied to me. And the guy just scratched his head. and goes, well, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's wrong with it. And he pulls the cord and gets it started. And all of a sudden, the guy jumps back. And he goes, what's that noise? Folks, the spirit of God, you got to rip the cord. You got to pull the cord. You got to access the power of the spirit. If you don't, and you're just, you got the spirit, but you're just doing it by yourself, you're not going to make progress. Pull the cord. When you find yourself in a situation where you feel like I'm going down a road I shouldn't be going down, plead with God through his spirit to come to your rescue. It'll tilt the odds in your favor. Uh, second one, there's two choices, to, a takeaway, two choices all true believers have to make. One is I have to choose to crucify the flesh. And we've talked about this, you know, Galatians 2.20, I've, I've been crucified with Christ. You've got to be, you've got to desire, you've got to choose to say, I don't want to live this self-centered life where it's all about me and indulging my sinful nature. And you have to let the spirit have control. You've got to crucify the flesh. You've got to let the spirit have control. You have to submit yourself to the Spirit of God. Uh, I find it interesting in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul, Paul teaches that we literally can quench the Spirit. I find that a fascinating thought, a fascinating word. Uh, when you're thirsty and you're dying of thirst, you quench your thirst. You literally, you pour water on it and you satiate it. You can quench the Spirit. So think of a fire. The Spirit of God is a fire that's burning inside of you that God wants to give you the odds to, to you're going to succeed this life but every time you, you choose not to listen, you're, you're just dumping water on the fire. And, 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 and it didn't go out, but man, it's really not what it was. And you're just dumping another pail of water on it and another pail of water. It, you've got to make a decision. I don't, want to, I don't want to live by the flesh. I don't want my life to be all about me. I have to learn how to uh, submit myself. Hey, here's the third one. Uh, understand this. We will all, at times, fall, get back up. Let me explain. Um, <clears throat> no matter how hard I try, no matter how hard you try, you're not, gonna, uh, you're not always going to submit to the Spirit. You're just not. And the problem is, is when you fail to submit to the Spirit, you can literally convince yourself God's done with you that you, you literally, you disqualified yourself. And you can become as, you can convince yourself God is as disgusted with yourself as you have become disgusted with yourself. It's not true, but you can convince yourself of it. If you do that, you, you literally can take yourself out of the game, out of the race, by just going, I just, I'm horrible. Now, there, there's a story told of a, a guy that was trying to get certified as a race car driver, and it was, he was in a school, kind of like a Bondurant school of driving, if you know what that is. And um, he was coming down to the final test, and so he was in this race car. He had a, he had a guy that was uh, critiquing him, uh, a you know, very skilled driver, was watching every move and you know, literally scoring him on how he did. And he's doing fantastic. He's ripping and tearing through the curves, and everything's awesome until it wasn't. He, he literally slid off the track. And when he slid off the track, everything inside him just goes, God, just quit. And he didn't do that. He, he put it back in gear, and he, 
got back on the track and he finished the race and he got to the end and pulled the car over and stopped the car and he looked at the guy and he goes, I failed, didn't I? And the guy said, why do you think you failed? He goes, because I slid off the track. And the guy looks at him and he goes, everybody slides off the track. You slid off the track, makes you normal. You know, you know what you did remarkably well? How quickly you got back on the track. That was noteworthy. Oh, no, you pass. Folks, I slide off the track sometimes. How long am I going to stay off the track? How long are you going to stay off the track? Get back on the track as quickly as you can. And fourth and lastly, you will ultimately choose who wins this battle. You're, there's a war going on. The spirit of God and, and the sinful nature, and they're contesting for your loyalty. And you're, you're going to decide, and I'm going to decide. Again, to take you back to the same two questions. Which one's currently winning? If it's not the one you want to have win in the end, make a change. Do something different. Because if you keep, you know, I'm choosing poorly, I'm choosing poorly, I'm choosing poorly. Before you know it, you're going to get in a, on a road in a direction headed towards a destination. Get off that road and get on a different road headed to a different destination. Um, one last story is two dogs that were in a fight. These two dogs were going at each other. Same guy owned both dogs, and these dogs were fighting, going at each other, and they were comparable size, and they were comparable strength, and, and they're going at it, and they're just fighting, and the guy let them fight, and then another guy asked the owner of the dogs, he goes, which of these two dogs is going to win? And the guy just looked at him, he goes, well, it's really simple, the, the one I feed the most. So which is going to win in me? My sinful nature or the spirit-led life? The one I feed the most. What's going to win in you? The one you feed the most.